A reading now from Luke's Gospel, the 11th, uh, sorry, the 17th chapter, beginning with verse 11. Listen now, friends, for the word of the Lord. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was, not, was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are times when I wish that we had audio recordings of Jesus' sayings. I would love to hear his tone of voice when he says something like, we're not ten made clean, but the other nine, where are they? There's a lot of ways you could make that statement. You could intonate in a certain way that, that could ring differently. Um, and when we ask questions, sometimes we're asking something other than what we're asking, right? I remember a few years ago, several years back, uh, there was an interview of, of David Bowie on NPR, and um, Terry Gross was interviewing him, and, and, and he was answering questions, uh, you know, about his 50-year music career, and, and I'm a big David Bowie fan, by the way, so I was very interested. In fact, Ziggy and Stardust are, are cats' names. No joke. So, uh, speaking of Ziggy Stardust, actually, all of her questions were about the Ziggy Stardust era of Bowie's career. Like, all of them. And, it, and the interview was going on a long time. It was kind of, it was obvious the interview was there wasn't much time left, and all of the questions were about that period in, in his musical career. And, you know, I, I, I love Terry Gross. I love listening to her interviews, but I was getting a little disappointed. I wanted to hear about other decades of his music. And it was funny because when I was starting to feel that way, David Bowie must have been feeling that way a little bit too because she asked him another question about Ziggy Stardust, and he said, well, well he said, really? That's all you're going to ask me about is Ziggy Stardust? And, and then he proceeded to answer the question. Now, in asking, is that all you're going to ask me about? That's not really what he was saying, is it? He was saying something else. He was saying, let's talk about something else. But then he was polite enough to answer her question that she asked. We're not ten made clean. He's not really asking if ten were made clean. He can count. He's the son of God. He can count to ten. He's got that skill down pat. But the other nine, where are they? Jesus must have been disappointed. And yet, maybe not. Let, let me explain. Jesus is passing through the region between Samaria and Galilee, so it should be no surprise that he encounters Samarians and Galileans, Samaritans and, and, and Galileans. But he encounters ten of them, some mix of Samaritans and Galileans, who happen to have leprosy. Now, back in those days, if you had leprosy according to the religious laws, which were not separate from medical understandings, right? Back then, if you had leprosy, you were unclean. If it so happened, which probably didn't happen often, sadly, 
that you were cured of your leprosy, you weren't recognized as being cured of your leprosy until you went to a priest, and the priest examined you and determined that you indeed were now clean, right? Because you're unclean if you have leprosy, and you're clean if you've been examined and found that you no longer have leprosy. Are you following me so far? So when Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest, all ten of them got it. All ten of them understood there was no reason for them to go see a priest unless he was saying that they would be healed, they would be cured. There was no other reason to go to a priest. In fact, they weren't allowed to go see a priest unless they were clean because they would potentially make the priest unclean, right? So they all show faith. Every one of the ten shows faith in going to see the priest. It's just that one of them recognizes what has happened and turns around. And of course, he says, you know, none of you found, none of them found to get, return and give praise to God except this foreigner. Get up, go on your way, your faith, your faith has made you well. It begs a little bit of a question, doesn't it? All ten of them had faith to go to the priest. All ten of them believed that they would be healed on the way, or it was at least worth walking to the priest to see if it would happen on the way, right? They had at least that much faith. He has somehow, perhaps, a measure of faith that goes beyond that because he turns around. He has enough faith to actually disobey Jesus, apparently, who told him to go see a priest. He says, no, I'm going to go back there and praise this guy. Praise God for saving me. Now, such a difference in faith. In Jesus' statement at the end, your faith has made you well, he says to that one who returns to give thanks. Some people have suggested over the years that maybe it's a different kind of salvation that he receives, right? The others receive the physical salvation of healing, Perhaps his salvation is then cosmic. It's the salvation of his soul. It's interesting. And, and that may be true. That might be something we could ask Jesus one day. But if it is true, it's interesting that one salvation came from asking, but the greater form of salvation flowed out of giving thanks and praise. So giving thanks is an aspect of our faith. Giving thanks makes us well. According to Jesus' words, from thankfulness flows joy. In fact, I've read a number of articles that indicate it would seem the happiest people in our society are not the wealthiest ones, as we might often be led to believe. But the happiest people are the people with the most gratitude. Now, you might say, well, that kind of comes with it. If we are happy, we might be grateful for the fact that we're happy. Okay. And sometimes it feels like we just don't have a whole lot to be grateful for. Jeremiah was speaking to a people who were not grateful in the Old Testament passage that Julie read for us. They had been exiled from their home of Jerusalem to live in Babylon in captivity. Exile. It's a concept that we may not understand, and yet I think a lot of us relate to very, very well. The sense that things aren't as they're supposed to be. That we're not in the place or the space that we feel most right. That life is just a little off kilter Yeah. For the lepers, they had their own form of exile in Luke's passage, right? They were living in exile. They were, they, they were living maybe in their homeland, but they weren't living like everybody else. They were ostracized from society. 
Things had gone wrong for them. Yeah, maybe we can relate to that. There's something like that in the last couple of years we've all experienced that we can relate to. Maybe still. Even when we're home, we may not always feel at home. You know, that sense of exile. What Jeremiah was telling the people is, uh, well, get comfortable with it. It's going to be some time that you're here in Babylon. So build homes. Marry. Have kids. You'll get to go home. It might be a while. The people of God were asking God if they could go home. God was telling them to make a home where you are. Sometimes I think we go to God wanting our own form of salvation. The lepers, they asked Jesus to be healed. It was obvious when they said, have mercy on us, what they meant, right? They wanted the leprosy gone. The Judites, when they were in captivity, they called out to God to go home. God said, make a home here. When we feel those exiles in our lives, we feel that sense that things aren't as we want, and we want salvation from it, whatever it is. We turn to God, and that's good. Have leprosy, pray to God for healing. Unsure of our place of eternal destiny, go to God for assurance of salvation. In both, it's good to turn to the Lord. But here's the thing. The Samaritan doesn't go back because he recognizes who Jesus is and ask Jesus for salvation. He goes back because he recognizes who Jesus is and he wants to give God thanks and praise. How much of our life in relationship with God is based on us asking God for salvation? Whatever form it is. And waiting for God to make things right for us. I think if we go into our relationship with God with what we want from God we can miss out on a lot more that God wants to do for us. Are you looking for miracles? Sure. God can give you miracles. I've seen it. I imagine many of you have too. Are you looking for eternal salvation? Absolutely. Come to the right place. But are we also looking for a relationship with God? Because in a relationship with Jesus Christ, we certainly will get miracles and we certainly will get salvation, but we'll also have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's something more. That's not just us going to God with a problem we want God to solve for us. That's us seeking God because of who God is, and we want to be close. Yes, go to God with your burdens. Go to God when things don't feel right. Go to God when when you need assurance and you need hope. Absolutely. But go to God when you don't need those things. Go to God when you just want to say, thank you. Go to God when you just want to feel near to the Almighty, who clearly longs to be near you. Seek Jesus. Abide in Jesus. The richest reward 
that Christ will give us may not even be the things that we ask for. May just be abiding in the one who wants to be near to us. Amen.